We'll now begin the House Education Administration Committee. Welcome members and all of our guests. Thank you for uh, being here. Members, we will go over the uh, calendar in one, in one moment, but we are going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Representatives Baum, Bolso, Butler, Sapicki, Fritz, Gant, Gillespie, Haston, Hurt, Lafferty, Love, McKenzie, Parkinson, Reagan, Ritchie, Stevens, Warner, Vice Chairman Slater, Chairman White, Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any recognitions that anyone has? I noticed we had some young people come in. Uh, has anyone got that on your calendar? If not, I'll just ask the spokesperson. Uh, we'd like to identify our uh, school age young people. Who Who is the spokesperson for that group? If you would, uh, stand up and just tell us who you are. <laughs> Thank you for being here. and. Uh, Appreciate it, and you're welcome to stay as long as you want. Even if you if you have another appointment, had to get up and leave, that's that's fine. Also, we we totally understand. But thank you very much. Anyone else have a recognition or an announcement? Seeing none. Okay, we're going to jump right into our calendar members. Uh, first off, item number thirty. Item number thirty, which is House Bill two two eight seven, that has been taken off notice. Item number one, House Bill 1059 by Chairman Vaughn. You are recognized in the well. Motion is second. Uh, identify any amendment that we're working off of. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Chairman. It's good to be with you all here today. Amendment is coded 017074. You got a motion to second on the amendment. It does rewrite the bill. Is there any objection to adding the amendment to the bill for proper discussion? Hearing no objection, all those in favor of adding Amendment 17074 to the House Bill 1059 indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Your bill is properly amended. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for those of you who have been on this committee for a few years, you uh, have congratulations. We, were on, we weren't the first, but we were in the top 10 states in the union who contemplated the name, image, and likeness issue with regards to uh, student athletes following uh, several court rulings that came out from across the country. And, and this body saw uh, fit to prescribe some guardrails within that, uh, within that space. It's been a rapidly evolving space. Uh, we started off with setting up the parameters for um, how student athletes uh, can use their name, image, and likeness to receive compensation. We also had protections in there for the member institutions that those athletes uh, uh, played for. Move fast forward, then we the next revision that we brought in uh, contemplated that the use of teams, individuals within teams, uh, primarily from the video game revenue. They're, they're renewing the NCAA football video games. And, and so as we did that, we talked a little bit about the team aspect and group uh, licensing. And then we also provided a very important clause in the last revision, which stated that uh, no uh, athletic association can prevent athletes from earning name, image, and likeness compensation. And that was what our attorney general expressed to the NCAA when they begin to have some concerns with uh, UT's participation in the Citrus Bowl. And then moving forward, what we've done, as, a, as you may or may not be aware, there's been uh, other legal action brought against the NCAA due to sanctions where they had, uh, we think they had improperly were trying to sanction UT. Uh, and what we're doing with this is, is we're providing uh, some new wording, some new amendments, which coincide with not only things that the Eastern District of Tennessee's uh, federal court's assertion 
uh, with regards to the NCAA, but also some information. A lot of this is coming from our attorney general who has been, who's done, I believe, a really bang up job of getting out on the front end of this and allowing uh, our athletes to continue, uh, whether it be from one end of the state to the other, but they are allowed and treated like uh, any other individual can with regards to receiving compensation for the name, image, and likeness. Uh, specifically, this bill expands the definition of inter intercollegiate athlete to cover current and prospective students. Uh, this, this provision aligns with the state's case against the NCAA's anti-competitive restrictions that we've seen. Uh, it allows an athlete's ability to basically do their due diligence and figure out what their NIL is worth in certain situations. Uh, it provides that institutions are prohibited from compensating student athletes uh, unless it's permitted by federal law. And, and the reason we have that provision in there is what this space desperately needs is national boundaries and to where everybody has a consistent playing field with it. And we're hoping that that's going to come from the NCAA. Uh, however, I, I have learned not to put a great deal of faith uh, for common sense to prevail with the National Collegiate Collegiate Athletic Association. So this provision's in there, um, but it would not be applicable if there's not a national movement on there. Uh, it makes it clear, perhaps a little bit uh, clearer language than what we've got in there, that the NCAA shall not in any way abridge an individual's property rights or restrict an athlete's ability to earn compensation or obtain representation and to perform that due diligence to determine the value of their NIL. Also in this bill, this revision, because of the ever expanding, you know, this is this is stuff that's being formulated as we go, uh, includes liability protections for institutions and their employees and their foundations. And basically what this provision is seeking to do is to keep an athlete from suing their coach for not giving them enough playing time and, and saying that that affects their market value. And so we're basically putting in here that that uh, coaches are not to be sued uh, in affecting athletes' values. Uh, let's see, also states that institutions and their employees are not agents. That's very important because we agents would receive compensation in terms, uh, have, agents typically have a financial interest in their clients' uh, compensation. This clearly states that, that that's not the case with uh, institutions. And then this also reinforces uh, that our attorney general has the ability to bring an action against the NCAA in court. And so that's a lot of words, uh, but I appreciate you listening, and I'll try to answer any questions you may have uh, to the best of my ability. Thank you, Chairman Vaughn. Appreciate it. As I mentioned before, I appreciate you taking a, a hard work on this. A lot of moving parts with a, not a lot of national uh, guidelines, I would say. And so it's been hard. So one last question. So when the coach kept me on the bench in seventh grade basketball, I had no re I had no recourse, right? <laughs> that is that is correct, sir. Okay. Now I, know. I don't know. I, I've seen your quickness. You have an inherent quickness, and I think you probably could have beat people to the baseline. Yeah, coach did the right thing. Let me recognize uh, uh, Representative Balso. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Vaughn. Thank you for bringing this bill. I have just a few questions, though. First, how many years of eligibility do you have remaining in your co co collegiate athletic career? Representative Bolso, I think I would find myself next to Chairman White on that bench. That's all I can say. <laughs> so one purpose of this legislation is not to improve your uh, NIL position with regard to the NCAA's anti-competitive practices in violation of the Sherman Act. That, that, is, that is correct, sir, because believe it or not, in college, and this is one of the th reasons why I take such interest in this, is that in college, I was, as many of you know, I was the Tiger mascot at Memphis State, a two-time national cheerleading champion. I was allowed to earn money during college by going and making appearances in this, uh, in my costume. And in addition, we won a ton of scholarship dollars from, uh, from activities and contests that flowed back to us. 
And that's exactly what was not happening with our athletes until these federal court decisions were happening. They were, they were earning and winning and this, uh, and schools profiles were increased. Suddenly we started seeing TV contracts as opposed to being millions of dollars. They were worth billions of dollars and things just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And it's the capitalistic side of me that says hard work should be rewarded. And if people work hard and excel and become famous, I'm sure they're, they're doing it with it via a platform that are our institutions. And, but at some point in time, the value of that tuition is greatly a, the diminishment of the, of its percentage versus the revenue is such that I was, this seems to be to me, just capitalistic play that our athletes should be able to do to hard work, be compensated. And, and again, it, it's one of those issues that has every year, you know, first the NCAA, we were outlaws when we first approved our state, state law. And then the NCAA says, oh, there's no rules. We're not getting into this space. And today we find ourselves saying, well, they're not in this space now, but they sure want to jump in and out of it. And so what we're just trying to do is, is as we see things evolve, such as, um, uh, such as going on right now uh, in, with regards to Knoxville, we just got to try to stay one step ahead of us. And I think that, that it's, it is so evolving over time that, that it's going to take tweaks like this along the way to make sure that we stay uh, where we need to be. And that's on the front of it. You have a follow up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two substantive questions. First, I mean, you touched on the issue of uh, the definition of intercollegiate athlete to include prospective students. But I noticed that uh, the word institution is defined to include a four year public or private institution of higher education, but does not include uh, an institution that's governed by the Board of Regents. And I was just interested in knowing why the bill carves out the institutions that are governed in Tennessee by boards of regents. You recognize? Typically that uh, we don't see them participating in NCAA sanctioned uh, events. And so that's, that's the reason why that is. And then finally, um, and you also touched on the liability provision, uh, subsection C on page two. And I noticed that there's a, a, a qualified immunity here that uh, extends immunity if a decision was made in good faith uh, versus one that was not made in good faith. Was there any particular reason that the uh, qualified immunity was drawn at the line of, of good faith and not somewhere else? Chairman Vaughn? You recognize? Counsel, yes, I don't know whether to call you representative or counselor, Representative Bull. So um, you're a much more learned uh, attorney than, than I am. I'm just, you're, I'm a lowly engineer who happens to be a sports fan. That uh, that finds passionate in the passion in the subject matter. Uh, I would assume that what we're trying to do there is, uh, if it's almost in the the with regards to any type of liability, uh, there if you make a mistake, but then if you if there's wanton misconduct or, or purposeful actions, I think that's what we're just trying to do is is draw a line here to say that that if people are acting in good faith. They're covered, but if there is some nefarious behavior or something along there, then we're not extending it. We're, it's not blanket immunity. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Vaughn. I'm happy to support this bill. It's a great piece of legislation. Thank you, Representative McKenzie. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I too will support this this bill, but 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 I do have some concerns. Um, and 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 the big concerns. Well, let, let's 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 look at history correctly. Um, you know, when folks in California and student athletes started kind of demanding pay for their performance and things of that nature, this state was not in favor of it at all. People pushed against it. It was going to be the death of college athletics. So let's, let's make sure. I don't think we were innovators in this at the time. And I say that to say, let's, let's learn from that. I would rather, and I think we're still, now we're being reactive, in my opinion. We're reacting. I applaud Chancellor Plowman for getting out in front of this. I, what I, gross misinterpretation is what I say. Now we're getting legislation in to codify that piece with the perspectives or whatever that 
that that piece is. But I'm I'm going to push try to push us to be more innovative. Let's let's get to where we want to be. Even when this bill first came, I mean, we were competing with SEC states and schools. We're, so we were needing to get on even playing ground. Let's let's let's. In my opinion, I think we need to move beyond that. I think we need to say this is is what it is. We're not going back, and let's figure out what we want NIL to look like as the greatest state in this country. What, what we want our college athletes to be, how we want them to be compensated. And let's push that to the NCAA instead of just being wrecked. We, we can throw stones at the NCAA all we want. Or we can give them a rock and say, this rock will work. You know, and uh, that, that to me would be a better approach. Um, my first question is, what, what, what would you say about what, what I've just said, especially as it relates to to us not being reactive. This is a much needed piece of legislation, but it's reactive. So would you be, since you've been kind of carrying this 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 torch, would you be uh, amenable to, to let's get together and let's, but not the, the royal we, and put something together that's what the University of Tennessee, University of Memphis, and other large universities can use to really uh, uh, manage their athletic programs? Chairman Vaughn? Well, I think that uh, I'd say that was curious support for the bill. It, it, <laughs> it, the in I don't have an issue in doing that. I think that what has happened with regards to this is that there were uh, in the in the beginning. I know that the the friend sitting next to you that I'd like to refer to now as the cat in the hat um, has been when we were on higher education that uh, subcommittee together, he was very passionate about this issue. The, the problems with regards to saying that we're not innovators in this space, I don't think I claim to be an innovator. I think we, I think we're leaders. Um, but there were obstacles as we brought this forward that were not just within this institution, but even within the institutions themselves. There were folks on the Hill that were in charge at the time that didn't think this was the thing to do. So whenever you have something that is that you're trying to introduce, you've got to find the path that it can get down. There's been a many good ideas up here that on the ideas themselves have had a lot of merit, but the execution of them is where they fail. In this case, this space is evolving so rapidly that we're who would have known that we would have been seeking input from our attorney general on matters of collegiate athletics. That I don't I don't think anybody had that one on their bingo card. But I do think that as the acceptance of this concept and this space shows as we see what's going on around the country um, I think it will continue to evolve, and I think that we got to be ready for it. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not someone that is. And, and this is by no means anybody can file a bill with regards to this this space. And I would encourage them to do so if they have an interest in it. But I think that we need to continue to be measured in what we do, um, because there's a lot of different perspectives on this to where that affect the execution of it. You have a follow up? I do. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and again, I, I, I think what I say is strong support of this bill just doesn't go far enough. This, this, this gets us back to even. We wrote what we wrote. Then, uh, well, we didn't cover pers uh, prospective student athletes. Well, we probably should have. Maybe didn't think of it. So now we're dealing with it. And we're giving the attorney general powers as he's already exercised. Uh, you know, he's already filed suit. So th this is catch up is what I'm saying. So I want to catch up, but I also want to move forward. And you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, administrations matter. <laughs> uh, leadership matters. And, and, and to your point, leadership at the time was not interested in. But this leadership is. This leadership has shown to be pretty innovative and pretty, you know, aggressive and pretty outspoken. So let's get that momentum and let's keep it going 
to where we can do something above ground and stop being so reactive. That's what I'm saying. So I'm supporting this, but I'm saying let's not stop it. And you've been a champion of the a champion of this. So I, I would expect that to have your fingerprints on as well. I'm happy to work with you, but I think that this has been and it's been a great, a great um uh, um ride in, in terms of what you've been able to do. So thank you for that. I just want I'm just kind of encouraging you to let's 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 now let's let's expand it. So thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Let's go to uh Chairman Gant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move previous question. Previous question has been called. I do have objections. Let me first go to Representative Gantt. Would you uh, consider retract? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I retract. Thank you, uh, Leader Gantt. Uh, next one was uh, Representative Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Gantt. I'll try to be real quick, and and thank you, sponsor, for the bill. Uh, uh, and I think our attorney general here has done an outstanding job. I appreciate the job he's done uh, since he's been appointed where he's at. One quick question. You mentioned in your opening statement there about the bill, about a player being able to, to maybe uh, go back and sue the coach or something for not enough playing time or something like that. Would this bill address, and something I have a problem with, and as a big football family, uh, uh, is on bowl games when these when these when these players have been paid a scholarship for a full ride to, to UT, then they decide not to show up on and play on 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 the bowl game. Say if it's the Orange Bowl or say it's a national championship game, we have four of our best players sit out because there's bigger money down the road. Does this bill address any of that? Uh. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, it, it does not. It does not contemplate that that situation. I find that to be frustrating. But then I think if that was my child out there, uh, I may have a similar tell them say no need to get blown up this weekend. Whenever the the draft combines in three or four weeks, so I, I, I when I'm as a from a fan's perspective, it's frustrating. But from I understand it from the athlete's side too. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again, sponsor. But, yeah, I, I get it, too. I, I'd want my kid to go on and take bigger money down the road. <laughs> uh, Chairman Sapicki. Uh, thank you, and I want to apologize to Chairman, uh, Chairman Gantt. Uh, members, I have, I've, I have a conflict on this. As you know, I'm going through this process right now with two boys. So um, I, do I do appreciate NIL and the financial benefit it has to families out there, but because this will financially benefit me, I'm going to conflict out. So, Mr. Clerk, I'll be a pass. Thank you, Chairman Sapicki. Uh, Representative Parks and Richie, do would y'all like to ask a question before I go back to Representative Gant? <coughs> hey, Representative Parks, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, 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 Chairman, you know, I, I support the bill with a chip on my shoulder. And um, and and you know, for those of you that that were not here in 2013, I actually started this process for uh, name, image, likeness in 2013, and for years subsequently after that. And then I think a few years ago, the bill. And let me let me mention, and, and you know, and I've never said this publicly, but I'll say it now that there was a shadow uh, opposition, you know, from uh, universities here in our state against this legislation. So it hadn't always been happy go lucky and everybody's chummy chummy and singing kumbaya about this. And then the year before we passed NIL, it was killed again in education, uh, K, I mean, I'm sorry, in higher ed um, committee. And, um, and then passed by the chairman who killed it. And that's just honest truth, right? And, and so I, I do support it because, uh, you know, for me is is people over politics, but you know, uh, we could have had we we should have and could have been the the lead on this you know from the from the beginning you know but but there were you know a, a lot of reasons given uh, you know as if the NCAA was going to put us in timeout and 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 I was reminding our people that you know we're the state of Tennessee the NCAA has no power over the state of Tennessee and 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 what it was going to do is exactly what it did uh made you know forced all of the other uh universities and especially those in the sec and others to you know follow suit you know we had a chance to, to lead on this and i echo the sentiment of my colleague <clears throat> who says you know that we we don't have to play this game of of doing just enough 
you know, we can we can take this for lack of a better pun, take this ball and run with it, you know, and really, really make some innovative strides and and make sure that we 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 protect our our our, our athletes and, and our institutions, you know, at the same time. I do have a question. The the you recognize. The, the, oh, thank you, sir. I thought I was already recognized. Okay. <laughs> Right. So, so what, you know, because with, with the fact that um, uh, those schools under TBR are not involved in, included in this legislation, does that mean that those athletes cannot take advantage of, of the NIL opportunities? Chairman Vaughn? With regards to this piece of, let, no, they'll be under whatever guidance that their organization, their conference, the, the, if it's NJCAA, um, because I guess we would be talking in this case like Shelby State. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not called that anymore. Right. But, but yes. Yeah, Southwest. Right, right. Thank Excuse you. me. Uh -huh. yes, right. Don't call it, some people don't call it Memphis State. Right, anymore. right, right. Um, I would assume that whatever national guidelines they have with regards to it, they would fall under that. And I would think that, um, you know, lest we forget history, since we're going down the historical road, I think what the significant act that passed, that happened between the time that, that you had this bill and the t first time the state passed it was the O'Bannon court, federal court case. Uh, there was a, the, the landscape shifted immediately following that court case where this was at. And uh, your pioneering was done in a day pre that. And there were some of us which were, were concerned about that impact. And so that's, that's the way that uh, this brain remembers history, but, but I have, <clears throat> I have misremembered before. Right. And, and you have a follow up. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And this is one of those cases where you misremembered because because the O'Bannon case had cleared and and that same year that, that we were running it before you killed it. So just just a slight correction. And but but I, I do support the bill uh, with a chip on my shoulder. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, let's go to Representative Richie. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sponsor. Um, it, is there any active litigation still currently going on when it comes to uh state of tennessee and nil or N N ncaa chairman bond i believe there is yes all right and and i support the bill i like all the, the language and what it's going to end up doing um just want to end up calling that out there i've had some bills that have been killed this session already because there's active litigation in other departments um under the state's umbrella um but i like what this is doing and i just encourage all the other members to vote based on the merit of the legislation and what it's going to end up meaning to Tennesseans and the folks here versus active litigation. We're lawmakers. We're just going to move that forward, but thank you. Leader Gant. Question on the bill. Question being called. Any objection on the question? Members are now voting on House Bill 1059. All those in favor of House Bill 1059 moving to calendar rules indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes. It moves to calendar rules. Thank you, Chairman. Thank Vaughan. you very much. Thank you very much for bringing the bill before us. Item number two, House Bill 2276. Uh, saw Representative Mitchell in here earlier. He's not here now, so I'm going to roll House Bill 2276 to the Hill. Brings us to item number three, House Bill 1912 by Representative Bolso. You're recognized. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Second. Chairman. We've got one amendment. Okay, which one are you working off on, sir? Zero one three five seven eight. One second. Let me uh, hold on. One three four two six. See if that pops up on your latest one. Yes, Mr. Chairman. My apologies. It's one three four two six. We got a motion to adopt and accept. Now it does not rewrite the bill. Uh, members, would, would we like to discuss the bill, then come back to the amendment before we adopt it? Okay. Okay, without objection, all those in favor of, of adding amendment 13426 onto the bill, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The bill is properly amended. Representative Bolso, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is a bill, members, that simply cleans up uh, one provision in the teacher code of ethics in, in Title 49. Currently, uh, the, the code of ethics at 49-5-1003 uh, provides that a teacher uh, shall not uh, treat a student unfairly on 13 different 
enumerated bases. Uh, leader, uh, excuse me, Representative Bolso? Yes. We are on, now I understand why you had the wrong amendment. Uh, we're on House Bill 1912. I think you've got another, another one later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Do we need to resend, do we need to resend the reactions? Let me uh, start over if I could, members. My apologies. Um, members, this is uh, House Bill 1912. Motion on this bill. <laughs> we have a motion second this bill. We've, all, we've already properly amended it, so you're recognized. Uh, this, this one, uh, member, simply fills a gap in legislation that we passed last year where we extended uh, the HOPE Scholarship to uh, be used for completion of an advanced degree if it still met the uh, student's qualifications of having uh, used HOPE scholarship funds within five years of initial enrollment in high school, excuse me, in, in college. Uh, we uh, last year had the uh, extension of the HOPE scholarship program effective July 1 of 2023, which unfortunately caused uh, college students who were graduated uh, in May of 2023, not to be able to qualify uh, for the for this this statute, which would allow them, if they had Hope Scholarship funds remaining, to use those for an advanced degree, uh, not just their their baccalaureate degree. And what this uh, bill does is simply provide that if a student uh, received their uh, undergraduate degree uh, in the 2022 to 2023 year. Uh, they still remain eligible to use any remaining HOPE scholarship funds for an advanced degree if they comply with the provisions of the program. And that, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready for questions. Okay, members, with that explanation by Representative Bolso, any questions on his bill, House Bill 1912? Representative Ritchie? Thank you, Chairman and Sponsor. Um, is, was there any other reason other than the individuals that were graduating there in May on wh why the uh, 22nd date is and why we didn't go back to 2019 or something of that nature? I think uh, the answer simply is that when we were enacting the legislation last year, uh, I don't know that we actually contemplated it being retroactive, but we passed it in April when kids were still in school. Uh, I think many of us thinking that uh, it's going to be helpful to those who haven't yet received their college degrees to use this for an ad advanced degree. If someone had finished in 2019, then they may have already been out of the system for two or three years. Uh, so the reason it only is looking back to the 2022 to 2023 year is because we had students still in school when we were deliberating. Follow up? Yeah, yes, Chairman. Um, but I guess we've got to have a a deadline period on all, all everything that comes up here as far as for effective dates. And I understand the logic and understand where the heart is there. Um, I'm inclined to leaving it how it is. If we're moving it back to there, then there could be students that graduated in the, the fall semester th the previous year, and now we're omitting them or leaving them off. And are we going to come back next year to try to capture some of those folks that have graduated three years ago versus here's when it's effective and what's going to end up going forward um, is the only thing that I'm sharing. It. I think it, it makes sense as far as for some of those folks that are kind of unintended that are left off there, but there's always going to end up being a cutoff time. And as we keep moving it back, well, what about the class that was right before? What about the class that was right before that? Or So I, I'm more inclined to just leaving it how it is right now, but I understand where your heart is and the intent. Resident Bolso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand your point, Representative Ritchie. I, I grant that it has it has merit, but we do have to draw the line somewhere. And I think in looking at this legislation from last year, if we had thought it all the way through, I think we might have made it effective immediately rather than waiting until July 1. And I, I don't think we want students to really bear uh, any inconvenience or additional expense because we had an effective date of July 1 versus it becoming effective upon being signed by the governor. Thank you. Members, anyone else want to speak on House Bill 1912? The question's been called. Any objection to the question? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 1912 out to finance, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out to finance, sir. <laughs> Members, uh, if you're giving the discretion, uh, we 
a lot of these bills are being carried by members on the committee today. And last week, uh, the chairman board sat there for two hours. So I'm going to go over to House Bill 19. Item, excuse me, item 19, House Bill 2625. Chairman Board, you're recognized. You have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate you getting uh, taking me out of order. It means a lot. Uh, I do have an amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, you have, would it be 16800? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's the one. You got a motion to second. Does rewrite the bill? So in, with no objections, let's go ahead and add the amendment to the bill. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment 16800 is now added to House Bill 2625. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, House Bill 2625 is a pretty simple bill. And to give you a little background, a few years ago, the federal government made some changes that allowed for uh, institutions of higher learning to use a different institutional accrediting agency than the one that would be geographically associated with them. So in this area, most uh, pretty much all of our, our universities use SACs. And so all this bill does is it kind of codifies that in state law and it clarifies uh, that you can use a different accrediting agency than the one that's geographically associated with you. If you use one, it does have to be one that is approved by the federal government. Then it goes a little bit further and it uh, states that if a uh, that a, an accrediting agency shall not compel a public institution of higher education in the state to violate any state law or any adverse action that a public institution of higher education uh, that, that's taken against one of our uh, institutions of higher education would violate this law and it creates a private right of action for that university against the accrediting agency if they compel them or try to sanction them or, or, or discredit them for, pass, for uh, complying with state law. Thank you. Other questions? We're on item number 19, House Bill 2625. Questions been called for. Any objection? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2625 out to GovOps, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Is Chair Lady Littleton in the room yet? Okay, if not, we will come back to her. How about uh, Chairman? Uh, Representative Hill. Okay, we got Representative Raper. It's item number 20, House Bill 1831. Representative Raper, you're recognized. You have a motion and a second. This does have an amendment, to Mr. Chair. It does or does not? It does. It does, and that amendment is? 014289. That is correct. It does rewrite the bill. You have it a does. motion and a second. Yes, Any objection to adding it to the bill for proper discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Your bill is properly amended. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Parents have a right to guide their students' education in conjunction with education agencies to the best of their abilities. Oftentimes, students are on the border of the age cut off for grade levels and are slightly immature. The amendment, which we worked with the Board of Education and they approved, makes a bill and expands a parent's rights to elect to retain their child in grades K through two only. And uh, this, this is an and statement that both of these have to be prevalent. Uh, number one, the student has a has to have a documented academic or behavioral delay and the parent and guardian believes that retention may benefit the student. The amendment also includes a request from the Department of Education and they they also, we oblige to that and to add clarifying language that this bill does not supersede the school's obligation to comply with federal or state laws related to students with disabilities. This is consistent with our moves to empower families and ultimately respect the input of, of the parents. At this time, I'll open the floor for questions. With that explanation before us, any questions of Representative Raper? Uh, Representative Fritz? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as a lifetime educator uh, in today's environment, you being a lifetime educator, uh, uh, in today's environment, if I had a second grader or first grader and I just didn't think they were doing well, what would most school systems do? Do you know in the state? Would they would they allow me to hold the child back or would there be pushback? You recognize? 
in an ideal world, it needs to be a team decision. And um, uh, it, this is how this bill sort of evolved is because you had a, a child with a, a severe emotional disability. And uh, ultimately, it comes down to the M team decision. The M team decision ruled against this. But in the ideal world, if you're just talking about retention altogether, and we're not talking about state law that is recently been put in a, as far as retention is concerned. It needs to be a team decision. And and I'm scared in some cases that uh, it, it's actually ruled against uh, sometimes in parents. Thank you. Further discussion? Any objections to the question? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 1831 to GovOps, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Is uh, Representative Hill or Representative Hill back in yet? How about Representative Martin? Okay, we'll come back to them. Let's now go back to item number four, House Bill 869 by Chairman Lafferty. You're recognized. You got a motion in a second. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Give me one second. Sorry. Just let us know what amendment we're working off of. <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, I have amendment 14861. That is correct. It rewrites the bill. Any objection to adding it to the bill for proper discussion? Motion. Got a motion and a second. Any objection? All those in favor of adding the amendment to the bill indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You're recognized, Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, current law states that all TBR board appointments must come before the Senate. This is TBR we're talking about. This language clarifies that TBR board faculty and staff members do not have to come before the Senate for confirmation. Uh, currently, all public higher education local governing boards have faculty and student members, but none of those members are required to come before the legislature. Uh, another thing this bill does, it clarifies the treatment of grades and grade point average for students taking both career and technical and traditional dual enrollment courses. Uh, when a student takes a traditional dual enrollment course, they must maintain a sufficient GPA for the class in order to pursue a subsequent dual enrollment course. If they fail to make the grade, then the student is not eligible. However, this amendment will clarify that GPA requirement does not carry over from traditional dual enrollment eligibility to career and technical dual enrollment. Um, third thing this bill does, THEC, in collaboration with the Department of Labor and the Lee Administration and others at the state and national level, have developed a working definition for non-quality degree credentials. Uh, these are typically shorter programs of study, maybe three to five classes, that result in a certification of some type, but that do not fit within the traditional diploma, associate degree, or other degree categories. Typically, these are very industry or even employer-specific, and THEC has uh, been attempting to incorporate these types of programs into the Tennessee Reconnect, and this amendment will quad, um, codify that uh, worked out definition. And I can try and answer any questions. Okay, members, we had that explanation before us, House Bill 869. Questions? Questions been called. Objections? Hearing none. All those in favor of moving House Bill 869 out to finance, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank Your you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Bill passes to finance. Uh, I'm going to now go back to Chair Lady Littleton, which is 16. Chair Lady Littleton, we're taking some of the members who are not on committee. So you are item number 16, House Bill 2165. Chair Lady Littleton, you're recognized. You got a motion and a second. Any amendment we need to deal with? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, there are two. Uh, 15632 and 17364. Okay, members, let's first look at 15632. It does rewrite the bill. Any objection to adding it to the bill for proper discussion? Question been called. Any objections? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. That rewrites the bill. Now, your other amendment, 17364, does not rewrite the bill, but only adds a definition. Members, any objection to... You got a motion second on that amendment. All those in favor of adding it to the bill, indicate by saying aye. aye. Objection? The ayes have it. So your bill is 
and we will ask legal to roll those two together for you moving forward. Uh, your bill has been properly amended. You may describe it to us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill, as we're uh, amended, requires a request made by a student to an employee of the student's local education agency or public charter school for an accommodation to affirm the student's gender identity to be reported to the school administration and to the student's parents. The explanation is before us. And would you also, on the amendment 17364, where it says about the definition of student, could you describe what that means? Yes. It pro. Uh, it says 18, or 18 is excluded. Right, if you're 18 years old, you're excluded. Is, you're okay. excluded. Members, discussion. We have Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the sponsor, um, do teachers and counselors um, have the ability to maintain student confidentiality? Chair Lady Linton. If this passes, not for this, not for gendering. You recognize? Thank you. Uh, you know, seeing it, as we discussed in subcommittee, you know, seeing as this, this, this is a, it's a crucial time for the family unit. At the end of the day, you don't have to like it, but if this student comes out and says, I'm not like the other folks in my classroom for these reasons. That's a critical time for that student, that parent, that counselor. And for the first time to hear it is from a school administration person. Don't you think that would be very traumatic on that parent? And as opposed to, it, you know, kind of coming the way information normally comes, the, the, doesn't this bill interrupt the whole flow of communication and forces people that probably don't want to, and it does force, to come out to the parents and tell them that their son or daughter um, is whatever, you know, on, on the LGBT uh, spectrum? Chair Lady Littleton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's traumatic for the teacher to be put in that position, but I also think it's very important that the parents know because maybe they don't know and they want they could get therapy for their children. So I think in the long run, it, it's this bill is good for everyone because teachers do not want to be put in that position. Follow up. Thank you. You know that that homelessness amongst those students are 120 times larger. Than, than any other population. So I, I don't think it's gonna be a peaceful, most times it's probably not a peaceful resolution where you know folks come home and hug and that's the end of it. It's, um, and maybe it's the way the information, you know, I think we've all experienced a situation where if the information was delivered differently, I might've reacted differently. I, I, I know we've all experienced that. It's human nature. You can you can give a bitter pill properly. And I'm sure for these parents, it'll be a bitter pill. But to hear it come through the telephone on a cold voice with the school administrator and they're being forced to do it per this bill. Not that they wanted to handle it this way, but this bill forces that. Um, this is this is not a good bill. It's not a caring bill. Um, it's going to lead to bad situations across this state if and when it gets implemented. Um, how would you respond to that, that this is causing additional homelessness, additional potential violence amongst parents and caregivers and their kids as a result of some, some really sensitive information being delivered to a teacher? Like you said, maybe the student shouldn't have. Maybe they, but who else do they come out to? So, as my colleague from Williamson County said at one point, that 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 teachers are de facto parents. 
it was a Latin term for it, but I, I forgot what it was. But yeah, and because they spend so much time, that's it. They spend so much time with the children. I remember a teacher telling me that in the third grade. I'm spending more time with you, and she added it up, than your mom. Active time, not sleeping time. And that's a true statement. So there are bonds that are created. So that's why they want to come out to their students. So now you're saying, hey, you better not come out to him or her. So um, I don't know how you respond Chair to that, but thank you. Shirley Littleton, you're recognized if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a mother of four and always said that, you know, you send your kids off to school, you feed them breakfast, you send them off to school and they come home and you feed them, you give them a bath and take them and they go to bed. But the teachers are not equipped for this type of thing. They're not uh, educated to handle these things. And I think sometimes if a parent gets this word early and they can get their child the therapy that they need, I think that would save them from running away. And I think it would save them from the suicide that we've been talking about. If the parents could get their children some therapy because the teacher told them that of, of this problem. Representative Richie. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question on the bill. Question's been called. Any objection to the question? Hmm. Okay. Okay, members, uh, we have two objections. Uh, we're, we have to vote on the question. All those in favor of the question being called in the case of saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it. The question has been called. Members, we're now on House Bill 2165. All those in favor of moving it to calendar rules in the case of saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out to calendar rules. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sir. Chairman and Committee. Representative Hill, I see you back. Coming, if you, members, we're on item number 17, House Bill 1914. Representative Hale, are you carrying that for uh, Representative Hale? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, members, we are on House Bill 1914, item number 17. You got a motion and a second on the bill. Any amendments we need to deal with? Uh, no, sir. Doesn't look like it. You're recognized to explain. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill creates the Hunger Free Campus Program, which aims to address food insecurity in higher education. Uh, for a university to be considered a hunger free campus, the campus must have or establish a physical food pantry, partner with a food pantry, or establish a task force, including at least two members of the student body, to examine the needs and best practices of food insecurity on campus. And that, pending any questions, Mr. Chairman, seek passage. Members, with that explanation, uh, we'll go to Representative Parkinson first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really don't even have a question, but I'm going to make sure I'm on that list first before the question is called so I can ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any further discussion of our questions being called in the bill? House Bill 1914 uh, being carried by Representative Hill for Chairman for Representative Hill. All those in any objections to the question? Hearing none. All those in favor of moving out to finance indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? It moves out to finance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Mayor. Representative Hill, you have item number 18, House Bill 2851. You're recognized. You have Thank a motion you. and a second. You're recognized. I don't see any amendment on that bill. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so um, what um, House Bill 2851 aims to do is make sure that the public state universities and community colleges are complying with the U.S. Supreme Court ruling on students for fair admissions, which took place in 2023. Um, and uh, this is going to just add a line in the existing comptroller's audit on admission practices by our universities and community colleges here in the state. With that, seek passage. Members, you have that explanation before you. Questions? Representative Parkinson, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How many people you got on the list? One more after you. Roll me one space, please. Okay, Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, appreciate you allowing me. Um, don't you feel that we're, we've done enough? Is there ever going to be a time where we've just done enough to say there's no such thing as race-based admissions? 
in any of our state universities? Representative Hill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, I feel like this could be the uh, concluding action uh, to make sure that we have done enough. And so we, by adding a line in the comptroller's audit, we'll be informed here in the legislature as to the activities uh, of, of the uh, universities and community colleges. So I think this step is absolutely necessary. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could we go out of session so I could ask a legal uh, question? Without objection, we're out of session, legal. You may ask, address your question to legal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, to legal, are we sound as a state that we do not accept people on race-based admission? And if there's any TCA codes you want to quote, could you quote those for me? Just a that is the bill. A recognizing legal. Casey Washburn, Office of Legal Services. Um, Representative McKenzie, I'm not aware of a specific statute that addresses certain admissions policies that gives the, the institutions the ability to craft their admissions requirements. Um, this legislation would just require that the institutions in their admissions practices comply with the um, precedent set by the Supreme Court and students for fair admissions versus president and fellows of Harvard College in 2023. So to the extent that they're not compliant, that may be a, an issue for that respective institution, but I'm not aware of any particular statute that directs their practices in that regard. You want to follow up? Yes, yeah, uh, quickly. So, so you're saying that a university could, in fact, have admissions based on race? Legal. Under Tennessee Code. Legal is recognized. Uh, I'm not... I'm not addressing what their admissions policies are or aren't. There's no statute that directly addresses their admissions practices, but if they do have an admissions practice that's unconstitutional, that violates equal protection or um, violates a federal law, um, potentially there could be legal action raised against that institution. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, more questions to legal? Okay, we're now back in session. We're on House Bill 2851. Representative Parkinson, you're, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing. Okay, uh, Representative Warner. Question Question's been called for. Any objection to the question? Hearing none, all those in favor of House Bill 2851 moving out the calendar and rules, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Moves out. If you'd like to record as a no, please Thank see the Thank clerk. Members, turn over to item number 21, House Bill 2028. Representative Martin, you're recognized. You have a motion and a second. I see, I believe we have an amendment to deal with. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's drafting code 15614. You got a motion second. It does rewrite the bill. Any objection to adding the bill for proper discussion? Hearing no objection. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You are now recognized on House Bill 2028. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those of you in the... Uh, K-12 subcommittee heard testimony from my friend Rob Criswell, who tragically lost his brother, Greg, who graduated high school with me 40 years ago, eating dinner in a restaurant, a steak restaurant like all of us have done, and choked and uh, was unconscious and five days later passed away. Uh, just a tragedy. Uh, not everyone knows the Heimlich. Uh, they weren't able to get all the medical personnel there in time, and uh, Rob went on a mission to make sure that anti-choking devices uh, were going to be promulgated throughout Hamilton County. We've got them in our schools to our first responders. And so I'm offering that we would put together, this bill would put together a $500 grant program across the state of Tennessee where schools could uh, have these anti-choking devices in there in our schools and first responders all across the state with this three-year grant program similar to how we have fire extinguishers and defibrillators in schools to protect, uh, the anti-choking device would be something to be very helpful to date uh, with this, um, Mr. Cresswell's uh, organization and with others with uh, the anti-choking device, there's been over 2,000 lives that have been saved through this. It's one of the number one killers of small children and elderly adults. And so 
we're looking to provide an opportunity to provide these anti-choking devices in schools and first responders across the state. And with that, I stand ready to answer any question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Representative Parkson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anybody else on the list? Not so far. Question on the bill. Okay. Any objection to the question? Hearing none, and thank you very much for bringing this bill. Uh, all those in favor of moving where go? House Bill 2028 to finance in the case of saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out. Thank you. And members, item number 22 on your calendar, House Bill 2024, has been taken off notice. That brings us back to item number four, House Bill 8. One second. Uh, number, oh, as I stand corrected, item number five, House Bill 2486 by Representative Hurt, you're recognized. You have a motion and second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2486 would allow a director of schools to delegate specific duties to another administrator or employee of the LEA. The only duties that, I apologize, I need to hold up right there. I believe we have an amendment. You do have an <laughs> amendment. Uh, give us a number. Uh, I have 014263. That's what I have. It does not rewrite the bill. Members, any objection to adding the amendment before for proper discussion? Do I have a second? Did I? Okay, we have a second. Any objection to adding the bill? Hearing none, all those in favor of adding Amendment 14263 to House Bill 2486, indicate saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You may uh, explain what the bill does. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for missing that amendment. This bill would allow director of schools to delegate specific duties to another administrator or employee of the LEA. The only duties the director can delegate are those that the Board of Education has authorized and adopted in board policy. Um, the amendment just allows a local Board of Education to determine whether the requirements for the position of director of schools um, beyond uh, the only requirement of a baccalaureate degree. And with that, I'll answer any questions. That explanation. Members, Representative Parks, and you're on the roll. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You got to be quick on your feet in this committee. Um, is there anybody on the list? I do not have one. Question on the bill. Okay. Any any objection to the question? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of, at, of House Bill 2486 going out to calendar and rules, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out. Representative Hurt. House Bill 2489, item number six, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2489 is a, addresses a elementary PE teacher shortage bill. So last year we passed House Bill 897, which authorized the Department of Education to issue, issue an endorsement exemption to a licensed teacher to teach a PE class to elementary school students. This was appreciated by the districts, but it didn't completely solve the issue. And, and back in the fall, the director of uh, assessment and accountability for Lauderdale County reached out to me and she actually told me they created a new issue where licensed teachers are getting pulled out of academic classes in order to teach mandatory PE classes. Under current state law, anyone with a bachelor's degree can teach certain classes in an elementary school if they are granted a permit by the Department of Education. The only classes they cannot teach are elementary PE, uh, special education classes, and classes they require an end of course assessment. This bill would simply allow the Department of Education to issue a temporary permit for a person with a bachelor's degree to teach elementary PE if the LEA was unable to find a licensed PE teacher to fill this position. And I, I, I want to make note here that this legislation is not de-emphasizing physical education in, in elementary school. It actually is putting more emphasis on it which to allow LEAs to find a teacher that could, could be hired um, with a bachelor's degree that, that would be focused only on PE and not pulled from an academic or a, a, a regular classroom into the PE class to, to teach it temporarily. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Okay, we have a few people on the list. Representative Parkinson. Roll me two spaces, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Lafferty. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I was only going to be recognized to subvert uh, Representative Parkinson, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chairman Sapicki. Question's been called. Any objection to the question? 
Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2489 out the calendar rules in case you saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Item brings us to item number seven. Representative Hurt. Motion is second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me double check my amendments here. I don't believe I have one here. You are correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair Committee. House Bill 2494. Um, will correct a problem that has occurred due to an unintended consequence of a bill that was passed in 2021. It has come to light that the stipulations set forth in that previous bill mentioned for out-of-state RTCs are basically out of reach, and these facilities are not receiving education dollars for students they're admitting to into their facilities. So basically, members, we have facilities out-of-state that are taking in students from in-state and providing services that they can't find services for in the state. And up to the bill in 2021, they were not allowed to be repaid for those services they were providing to Tennessee students. In that legislation, we, we put some stipulations that have been, become a hurdle that they haven't been able to overcome. So the big, biggest challenges were students that arrive with an expired IEP, schools or LEAs that do not send records, and dem demonstrating consistent enrollment in an LEA for 180 days. In talks with the Department of Education, they have confirmed that since we passed that bill, no RTCs have been able to qualify for these education dollars, even though the students are in their care and they're providing them services. So this bill would eliminate the 180-day enrollment requirement in an LEA, but add language stipulating that the student's parents must be residents of the state. It would eliminate the 15-student requirement before a facility can request education dollars from an LEA, and number three, eliminate the requirement of an active IEP as some students' IEPs are inactive while others don't have an IEP at all. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. Members, House Bill 29, excuse me, 2494 is before us. Representative Ritchie? You pass. Representative Gant? Any objection to the question? I hear none. All those in favor of moving House Bill 2494 out of the calendar rules in the case of saying aye. Opposed? I uh, have it. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hurt, you're, you also have item number 25. While we have you before us, let's just go ahead and take up item number 25, House Bill 2487. You're recognized. Okay. You have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Um, members, House Bill 2487 deals with threats of, ma or threats of mass violence policy. Right now, currently, a superintendent has the flexibility to make case-by-case -case modifications to violations of the zero tolerance policy, um, guns, drugs, assaults, threats of mass violence. This bill provides that if a student makes such a threat before they are automatically expelled for a year, number one, they're automatically suspended, and number two, they must undergo a threat assessment to determine if it was a valid threat. This will provide additional information to the superintendent when making the expulsion decision, which he already um, does. But this would, would give him an opportunity to have more, give this director more information to make that decision on. Under current law, LEAs have a threat assessment team. Teams include principal, vice principal, mental health professionals, school support staff, and school security SROs. The bill also requires the threats be reported to the local police or sheriff. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll take questions. Representative Parkson, you, I believe you said you did have a question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Sponsor. These these threats, have we determined, um, you know, I don't know if there, um, if we have different levels of threats or what, at what point is it just there, there is no um, – um, enacting of this legislation should it pass? Uh, is it determined based on the type of threat or how do, how do we work through that? You recognize, President? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So right now we have the zero tolerance policy and this is just bringing the threats of mass, to, mass violence up to the policy of the others, which right now the director of schools will make that determination on the, on the after the expulsion has been, the steps have been taken. Well, all this bill will do is bring in the threat assessment team to to gather more information to give to the director of schools so that when they make that determination they have more information right now they do it anyway this is just giving an opportunity to get them more information to base that what that threat was on okay thank you thank you thank you ribs and richie thank you chairman and sponsor and 
I've received uh, multiple phone calls on some of the legislation uh, regarding the uh, zero tolerance. Um, and I think this is getting to that particular point. But the question that I have on it is um, there's been situations across the state when it comes to some of our students that are in middle school, sixth, seventh grade, and they've made comments, hey, I'm going to get a plane and I'm going to fly it into this. Um, it, does this end up taking any of the capabilities of that actually coming to fruition? Um, I've gone through pilot training and flown, and I don't know too many 12 year olds that either a have access to an aircraft b know how to fly it we need to take it serious to be able to address it but where those zero policies on expulsion and the stories that i've heard where the, those uh sixth graders are sitting out in a squad car out in front of the school for four or five hours while they're trying to determine what they're going to end up doing does this end up bringing any latitude in there when it comes to the ability uh, or taking that in that's what this is doing with this team ribs and hurt Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for that question because that's exactly one of the reasons this was brought. Um, we, we don't want to reduce the emphasis and the seriousness of a threat of mass violence. That's not the intent of this. The intent of this is to allow the director who already makes a decision after the punishment has been enforced can, can adjust it at the end. This just gives the opportunity to bring more people in to look at that assessment to see how valid it was and maybe what the student went through leading to that threat gives that information gathering time to the director so they can make that termination at the end and determine if that is an adequate punishment for the student of, of the age or, or where they were coming from and how serious that threat was. Uh, Chairman Sapicki, question been called on House Bill 2487. Any objection? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2487 out the calendar and rules indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. That brings us back to item number eight, House Bill 2008, that is being rolled to the hill of the calendar. Item number nine, House Bill 2283, rolled to the hill of the calendar, as well as item number 10, House Bill 2285, rolled to the hill of the calendar. At this point, members, I have a few bills before, so I'm going to turn turn the gavel over to uh, Chairman Slater. All right, committee members, uh, that brings us to item number 11, House Bill 2184 by Chairman White. Do I have a motion? <laughs> properly motioned, properly seconded, and uh, Chairman White, do you have an amendment on the bill? Yes, sir. Let's. The amendment should be 13368. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, mo motion second on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor... Say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted and uh, placed on your bill. Uh, Chairman White, you're recognized. Uh, members, what this bill is doing for us is this is the uh, making permanent the completion grant, which has been a pilot program for a number of years. As you know, through Tennessee Promise, uh, where we put a lot of money into to that, all our students in 12th grade take the FAFSA, and then they're able to, uh, Tennessee Promise pays for their uh, first couple of years of higher education. And this completion grant was put in place because we were finding that a lot of our lower income students, uh, the first year, they were only 32% were coming back the second year, the sophomore year. And so we implemented this completion grant where they had not only had a coach, but we also have a stipend of a, of $1,000 a semester to help them with things like transportation, groceries, computers, textbooks, or anything kind of life gets in the way. And since doing this under this pilot program, we now see that the retention rate has jumped up to 82% having a coach and as well as the completion grant. So we want to make this permanent because if we're going to spend money on Tennessee Promise, let's go from 32% to 82% to make sure we get these young people through. And with that is, that's the gist of the bill. Thank you, Chairman White. Uh, question, uh, Representative Warner. Thank you there, Chairman Sh uh, Slater, and uh, thank you, Chairman White, for the bill. Do you have the uh, graduation rates of our Tennessee Promise students, what that rate is? 
Chairman White? You know, uh, not before me. I cannot remember what it is. I may probably be able to get that uh, for you, but uh, we'll come back to that. But no, right off the top of my head, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, Chairman Sapicki. The question has been called properly seconded. Any objections to the question? Seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 2184 moving out to finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? HB 2184 moves out to finance. Committee, that brings us to item number 12, eight, House Bill 2179 by Chairman White. Do I have a motion? Motion and properly seconded. Uh, and uh, let's see, I don't see any amendments on the bill. So uh, sponsor, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. On this particular bill, what we're doing uh, with this one, um, under the GIVE Act that we adopted in 2022, we extended the eligibility for dual enrollment grants to students beginning in the ninth grade if they were attending a TCAT or Tennessee College to Applied Technology. What this bill would do is that we would now also give that same dual enrollment down to a ninth uh, and a tenth grader. Not only that we're doing it in TCAS, but we do it in our community college, colleges also. And so that's the gist of this, is what it was, allow students in the ninth and tenth grade to get started in their careers offered by a community college like the TCATs are already doing. And with that is the explanation of the bill. Thank you, Chairman White. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, so without objection, we are voting on House Bill 2179, moving out to finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, House Bill 2179 moves out to finance. Uh, committee, that brings us to item number 13, House Bill 2180 by Chairman White. Do I have a motion? No. Motion and properly seconded. And uh, what uh, amendment are we working off from uh, Chairman Wang? Let me, 14376. That is correct. And that uh, rewrites the bill. Do I have a motion on the amendment? M properly motion, properly seconded. We're voting on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. And your uh, bill is properly amended. And do you, um, you're recognized on House Bill 2180. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Members, what we're doing here, and I took this one on because I want to address, we hear about uh, every community across our state uh, has an issue with, with a teacher pipeline. And I think it was two years ago, we, we, we passed the uh, future teachers pilot program that would, if a, if a, a young person or of any age really was wanting to be a teacher then their junior and senior year we have this this scholarship this pilot program that would pay for those two years if they agreed to teach in a distressed or at-risk area well we've only had it's only been in operation for a year and we've only had one take advantage of it and the reason i picked this up is because WGU, Western Governors University, we've had that before, so and other things, uh, 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 Chairman Hurt and everything. And so what this does is allow WGU, because this is a grant, this is not coming out of, uh, out of Hope Scholarship, is that I would like to test the waters and see through WGU if we can help get more teachers through their system into our rural communities, especially our rural our rural teacher pipeline has a lot has a lot of um, issues and so the next four years seeing if using this system of, of virtual where a lot of the uh, teachers the, the average age of those going back in WG are like 33 to 35 and I heard I told this in subcommittee I heard a story one time in one of our rural communities there was a lady who worked in the cafeteria but she was so good with children. And one day they asked her, says, you know, you ought to be a teacher. So she went back and got her degree and she's now teaching elementary children. I think this is an opportunity to see for the next four years if we could possibly get uh, more teachers in the mid, mid range, 30s and 40s going back into teaching. And so I think this would be a, a good pipeline to maybe do that through uh, WGU. With that, I renew my motion. Thank you, uh, sponsor. Uh, Representative McKenzie, a question for the sponsor? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you for bringing this bill because it, it, it's sorely needed, especially in our in our rural areas as I, as they come and talk to, I'm, I'm sure, all of us. Uh, but to kind of what I think will bolster that, 
as far as the, the, the existing program, how many students have we graduated in our universities that, that take that? In this pilot program? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, this, we just passed this. I think it was uh, uh, two years ago, so it's only been in operation one year. And we've only had one, according to the facts I'm giving, only one person has taken advantage of this pilot program. It's a five-year, so we don't don't have figures yet. That's why I think it'd be good to to look at this and see if this would be – because we're asking them to go into our rural areas where a, a lot of times the economic situations are more challenging than, than a more uh, urban area. Or Follow up. Area. Yeah, I think that, that that was similar number. So it sounds like, but it's only one that's that's actively in the program currently. So this this is a great opportunity to 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 um, salt those those rural counties with some really high quality teachers. So thank you for bringing this, Representative Ritchie. A question. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Chairman, for uh, bringing the bill. Um, we sat down. I, I guess this is going to address those rural areas, and because of only being a year and not having the expansion that um, would be good for having the additional data. It was described to me that a lot of the students that are there at WGU um, are already potentially living in some of these rural, more distressed areas. So it's going to be a, a, a good common fit. Do you see any other schools that could end up falling to that, uh, that umbrella that we could end up addressing next year and coming back to where we can let this evolve out more to where we can go into some of these other schools and universities across the state of Tennessee? that have students that are already in those areas where we have a need to be able to address that. Has there been any conversations along that line? No, absolutely. We have these conversations and thank you for pointing that out. That's very true. Your, your first statement. And, but no, I think we, we definitely need to uh, have conversations all the time. Uh, Every district has an issue with having enough teachers right now, like any other profession, but especially in our rural communities, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the county next door to them or the district next to them, they can pay a teacher $15,000 more than they say could in, in, a, in a rural area because of the economic base. And so I would definitely hope we can find more and more universities uh, that can take advantage of this so we get more teachers in the pipeline. So I'd be very amenable to that. Representative Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sponsor, I, I really appreciate this this legislation. I, I think it's a, it's going to help our our rural um, areas, which I represent most of my district, is very rural. And so I know I have a number of WGU students in my district that are now working on uh, one degree or another. So if they're already uh, living in those communities, I, I think it's uh, pretty certain that they will stay there once they graduate to serve in these uh, rural schools. So I appreciate that, and I'd encourage my colleagues to support it as well. Any, any comment from the sponsor? No, thank you. Very, very yeah, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. That's one of the reasons I think this would be a good bill and it's a pilot for the next four years, and hopefully it will show some uh, positive results. Chairman Reagan? Question the Question's been called. Any objection to the question? Seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 2180, moving out to finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, House Bill 2180 moves out to finance. Committee, that takes us to item number... Uh, 14, House Bill 2540, 2559, excuse me, uh, properly motioned, um, and um, I see that you have an amendment, and uh, which amendment do you have there, Chairman White? Are we looking at 15027? That is correct. Uh, um, properly motioned, uh, all those in favor of adopting uh, Amendment 015027, uh, say aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it, uh, and your amendment is on your bill. You're recognized on House Bill 2559 as amended. Thank you, and, and Chairman and commi committee members. Uh, this is one that I really have a heart to uh, move, move forward also. Uh, we have in Memphis called the well, ever across state, the good the Goodwill Centers, and in Memphis they have started what is known as the Excel Center, which is a high school for adults that dropped out for whatever life reasons. And so, in my community, the figures I'm always given out of a popular urban population, we may have over 100, 120 thousand adults without a high school diploma, which means they cannot get into the workforce because they cannot get the Tennessee Promise or any or Tennessee Reconnect or anything. So how do you address that? Well, the Excel Center was set up 
and been working them for about nine years on, on different ways to keep them going. And the Excel Center is a high school diploma where, where adults go back. Well, we are trying to expand that now. We have one site in Memphis right now. We want to expand that to North Memphis and South Memphis. Actually, we want to expand it across the state. I think the figure I heard one time is across the state, and I may be low, about 20% of all Tennesseans don't have a high school diploma. So you know, we, for years we've worked on drive to 55 and trying to get more of our people uh, for, for a higher degree. It won't happen if you don't have a high school degree. So what the Excel Center has done is what we're having to put into place. They now have the, the funds that, where they can build more facilities. We had a, a, a bill a couple years ago and it came down through federal money where they got money to build new facilities. But because they are currently a contract school with the Memphis Shelby County school system, then you don't get funding for operations until the second year, which means they really can't get started because you got to pay teachers and all the operation things the first year. So in charter schools, you, you do get funding the first, you do get TISA funding. So all this bill is going to say is that a contract school like a charter school would get TISA funds the first year. So they have operational monies to, to, to uh, when they expand into other schools. And that's what this particular uh, bill does. It's just uh, what does that. Thank you for the explanation. Any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 2559, moving out to finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 2555 moves out to finance. Uh, committee that takes us to item number 15, House Bill 2679 by Chairman White. Properly motioned, properly seconded. And uh, you have an amendment. Is that uh, correct, uh, Chairman White? Let me double check here. Uh, you may have to tell me, is it 13183? Yes, 13138. Is that? Ah, one. There you go. I was looking at the wrong one. Uh, what do you have there? One, three, one, eight, three. Is Correct. That, okay. That's the amendment that we're working off from. Motioned and seconded. So we are uh, uh, voting to adopt uh, uh, amendment uh, 13183. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, your bill is now properly amended, and uh, you're recognized on your bill. Uh, thank you, members. This is uh, thank you for your patience. This is the last one uh, that we have here. But this this is a school turnaround pilot program expansion. A number of years ago, and this comes from Senator Farrell Hell. We worked on on, on this a couple of years ago. Across the state, uh, our schools that are in the bottom five percent uh, priority status across state, we. Uh, propose this bill where it's a grant program where we would then, uh, let me just read this. This legislation stands a school turnaround pilot program that we created in 2021. Currently the pilot had five schools. They were chosen by the department of education in agreement with those schools. Uh, they're not forced only if they want to, but if they're in the bottom 5%, uh, then we, have this grant program where those agencies that know how to go in and bring them out of the bottom 5% and work with or turn them around. And what this does, this will extend it indefinitely since it has been successful past the 2025, 2026 school year, which is when the, when the uh, pilot program ended uh, and we'll go from five schools to 15 schools. So it's an effective program that's been in pilot for a number of years. It's got one more year to go and that would have to bring these bottom of 5% of schools that the department can work with to bring them up out of priority status. And with that, I renew the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none, we are voting. Oh, uh, I apologize. Uh, Representative McKenzie. Oh. Oh. Or Parkinson, excuse oh. me. Oh. <laughs> I, I almost, almost, Forgot my question. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, the uh, I've been called worse. So, you know, the, the um, um, with this, the fact that we we are at some point um, removing the or changing the way the achievement school district operates 
this will still just be for those schools that are in priority space. Am I correct? The, well, this is no K. This is K through twelve. Right. 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 If, if they're a priority school, it, it gives it since we do have agencies out there that have the ability to work with a school on, on a daily basis to, to help them bring them out of that priority status. That's what this would do. It's, okay. a, grant, it's a grant program. And you recognize. Thank you. And, and but it doesn't necessarily is we're not tying it to the achievement school district, though. Am I correct? No, that's correct. Thank you. That's what I need. Thank you, sir. Representative Butler, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move previous question. Question has been called. Any objection to the question? Seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 2679, moving out to finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 2679 moves out to finance. Thank you, members. We're now on item number 23, House Bill 2784 with Chairman Reagan. You're recognized. And we do have an amendment to deal with. Yes, sir. Amendment drafting code is 15786. That is correct. Motion is second. Any objection? Does rewrite the bill. Any objection to adding it to the bill? Hearing none. All those in favor? Indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You are amended. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Uh, last year, this body passed the Tennessee Higher Education Freedom of Expression and Transparency Act. Among the requirements in that bill was it created a pathway for higher education students and employees to file a report if they believe their institution had violated the divisive concepts legislation that was passed in 2022. The act also required institutions to investigate and report uh, on those complaints. This bill, as amended, strengthens the current law by requiring, current, uh, requiring institutions to report the results of their investigation of alleged violations to uh, within 10 days of the investigation being complete, and it requires institutions to provide a status update every 30 days to the comptroller regarding ongoing investigations, requiring these institutions to appear before the joint government operations if the comptroller deems that the institution has failed to report such an investigation result or has failed to take corrective actions. These institutions must appear no later than 60 days after a notice of noncompliance. Requiring the comptroller to report to the education committees if the comptroller receives more than 10 reports of separate violations of an institution in a single academic year. This clarifies that a student or employee is not required to file a report of an alleged violation before pursuing any other potential legal remedy. With that explanation, I stand ready to answer questions. Okay, members, we have House Bill 2784 before us, Representative Parkinson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How many people are on the list? Uh, one more. Uh, roll me one space. Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know at one point when they, one of the complainants at the University of Tennessee who complained about divisive concepts being taught was like a 75-year-old person in Arizona auditing a course. So it wasn't valid. It was just some extremist trying to make a point. My question to you is, with the way this is set up, couldn't we easily have an extremist file 10 complaints? Because there's no, on your numbers, one person can file 10 complaints that would enact a trigger. Um, first, is that a true statement? And then two, what safeguards are in place to prevent this wasteful uh, act on that particular employee? Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Answer the question. Uh, subsection 2B, subparagraph A of the bill specifies that a student or employee of the public institution is eligible to file these complaints. That said, the investigation has to take place and the comptroller has to determine that the investigation was inadequate. If they file 10 complaints and the investigations are all adequate, uh, then the only trigger would be for them to <coughs> report to the Government Operations Committee. Uh, if the Government Operations Committee finds that the investigations are adequate and there's been abuse, there's a separate avenue for that. 
You recognize? Thank you. That's a horrible waste of time for people that are simply trying to educate our kids in a very dynamic and evol evolving situation. You're going to extol all those resources to where, again, I'll say, clear laws on the books, most of which you've been the person to bring the bills to us. To what end, Representative? When will these type of bills stop? When do we get to where you're satisfied that no DEI concepts, no no CRT concepts, nothing divisive in any kind of way, shape, form, or fashion is taught in our K through PhD programs in the state of Tennessee. When does this end? Chairman Reagan, you recognize? First off, this doesn't affect anything K through 12. This is only higher education. Secondly, uh, the divisive concepts law was passed in 2022. Based on the number of complaints that have been filed to date, your supposition is not going to be uh, coming to fruition. The idea behind this is simply so that we in the, the legislature have someone reporting to us on the effectiveness of the investigations, both in terms of their uh, completeness and their number. Simply stated. Follow up. Uh, final question. You know, to those large numbers, I, I really appreciate former Representative Ron Ramsey when he sat here and was interrogated by several of uh, members of this committee at the time, when he pushed you all to come up with a number, it was all theoretical. There was never a number given. And he said he's not dealing in that. And this is a very conservative member of your party. And I really appreciated that man for, for saying what, what this is. So again, we need to track this. We need to look for waste, fraud and abuse in this divisive piece of legislation. And I would hope once we find that, your committee would deem bills like this unnecessary and an overreach. And your committee will stop this General Assembly from doing these types of wasteful acts, because that's what your committee should be looking at. And I'm sure that's what they will come up with if we take a sincere look at these wasteful acts. Track the dollars, track the hours, we'll come up with these are horribly wasteful events to do political wrangling. You recognize, sir? Thank you, and to the sponsors, or to the uh, questioners uh, uh, implication there, that's exactly what this bill does. It creates a tracking mechanism so that we become aware as a general assembly of the quality of the investigations and the number of them. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what happens if, you know, we we realize or find out through through this tracking system that it's really not worth our time? Do we do we then come back with legislation and 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 say that you know a uh, job well done to Chairman Reagan because you know we you 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 stop what you were trying to stop chairman reagan uh in, in the first place i'm only one vote i'm only one able to carry one bill at a time so it is the general assembly's will that these have been passed yeah. so uh, i would say that our body is responsible as much as any one individual that said the idea behind this is straightforward again we in the general assembly are going to be made aware by virtue of this reporting mechanism of the effectiveness of the investigations and how many are done if in fact there aren't that many and we're satisfied with the effectiveness of it, it's going to be like any other uh, report that's monitored by our comptroller. They will alert us that the mechanism is working as it should. Representative Parsons, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and 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 thank you, Chairman Reagan. I would I would I would I would venture to say yes. You, you're correct. You are one vote, one vote, but you're a very influential vote. And a lot of people follow your lead on on some of the on most of the legislation that you that you run up here, and so you know and so that matters you know in the environment that we're in and so you know I just say that you know if hopefully 
you know, if you if you get to the point to where you know we see that these are is not as 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 um, urgent or or as pervasive rather, then we thought that you know maybe we can we can you know back back off the universities a little and and allow them to just get to university business and allow these students to be students and these and the faculty to be faculty. Just a thought. Uh, Representative Ritchie? Question been called. Any objection? Withdraw. Okay, we'll go to Representative Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Reagan, first, thank you for bringing this. Uh, four years now, I've served as the chair of the Higher Education Subcommittee, and it has been Bothersome is not a strong enough word, but I'll stick with it. Bothersome, the number of letters that I've received from students, from faculty, from people inside our institutions across this state that are scared to say anything to anybody in administrations there locally because they are concerned of being put out of a job, denied a promotion. I'm here to tell you that these things are going on on our campuses, and they need to be looked at, they need to be reported, and thank you, sir, for bringing this legislation. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, I'll somewhat echo the comments of my colleague who just previously spoke. Um, I was uh, quite alarmed at some of the letters and dialogue, face-to-face uh, -face dialogue I had with other students or parents of young students. And in a couple cases, adult students who were uh, pressured, coerced, almost to the point of extorted in their words, in their words again, uh, to comply with ideologies that they've found completely divisive and un-American. And so it is important for us to have a mechanism in place because we cannot manage what we cannot measure. And I appreciate you bringing this bill. So thank you so much. Representative Parkinson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, for getting to me before you got to the others. The in, in, in interesting uh, commentary from my colleague and in, in who, who who I'm very fond of. Uh, don't want to call his name, so he had to go back to to him on the mic though. But I do like you though. But but so you know, interesting. Um, when when we say that in in these in these complaints that uh, an individual has to comply with, I guess that's the, the words. I'm, I hope I'm using the right words. Did you say comply? Comply with, comply with, you know, with the with these ideologies when you're in in a university university setting, you know, because a a, a professor teaches certain ideology, doesn't mean you have to uh, co-sign with what that professor is is saying. Am I am I correct or incorrect in it, Chairman Reagan? Uh, sir, I submit you're incorrect. There's okay. a difference between educating and indoctrinating. Mm -hmm. And the divisive concepts law that we passed in 2022 is aimed at ensuring that it's not indoctrination. And as was mentioned earlier, there is an element of coercion, uh, either intentional or may maybe otherwise, when you're sitting in a classroom and you know that professor is going to give you a grade and they're outlining particular ideological concepts and you're then put in a position if you disagree, but you have academic credentials or, and or capabilities to submit the disagreement, but you know that it'll be turned down, uh, that, that boils down to a fear of re retribution. And this is aimed at eliminating that. Uh, that idea of education, whether you're talking K through 12 or higher education in general, is that the presenter of the information, the teacher, the instructor, the professor, is presenting the information in a manner consistent with learning not indoctrinating and the indoctrination piece is what this is trying to prevent <clears throat> follow up thank you thank you for that so, and so it, 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 interesting um um so if, if you have a professor that's that's teaching on the uh, the renaissance period in in europe and and he, he, in in a in a student that disagrees with how the 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 professor is is presenting the information 
you know, but but I was I was I've always thought that our universities were places for for our students to be there to be fine tuned analytically, to be able to think, you know, independently anyway, and to be able to, you know, to uh, you know respectfully, you know, push back on 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 you know their understanding of of you know of what you know what they've been taught even before this. And I just, I just, I just see it as, as, you know, it, now if if the professor professor is teaching on uh, the Renaissance period, and if I just simply don't like what he's saying, I can report him or her because I simply disagree with them, and and so that's that's what what makes you know this whole this whole trick that we've gone down you know, a, 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 just a little uncomfortable for me because I think, I think it's actually going to have a, a, a reverse effect of, than what we're trying to get, you know, um, and, and it's going to, you know, in, in some, in some manners, you know, stifle, stifle curiosity, stifle possible growth and, 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 you know, and, and cause a, a possibly a whole plethora of reports to come down the line, possibly because, we simply disagree with what the 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 instructor is teaching or 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 how they're teaching it, and that's just my concern. But thank you, thank you, uh, Representative Richie. Thank you, Chairman and uh, sponsor for bringing the bill. I'd only call to question because I completely uh, agree and support this legislation. My son's a freshman in college right now, and during the fall semester he dreaded going on Tuesdays to his English professor because he sat there for two hours and he had to listen to an hour and 45 minutes about white privilege and racism and everything else that had nothing to do with English. And those were wasted taxpayer dollars for a lot of the other students that were in there. And it was wasted my dollars because we paid for our son to go to the university, to the college to begin with. When at the end of the day, that teacher was there to educate our student on English. That's what he was there for. He wasn't there for any of those divisive concepts and things of that nature. You hear DEI, my son coined it best probably. He said, all that is, is didn't earn it, um, is what it stands for. But, uh, but, okay, I'm sorry. I was having a discussion with legal. Uh, Reverend Richie, I'm sorry. I wasn't. You, well, okay. Let's stay on the subject then. Okay. Representative Richie, you may continue, but let's stay on the subject. So, like I said, if our educators are actually teaching on the policy and the class that they're tasked to do with, we would have better educated students coming through. So I completely support this legislation. Thank you for bringing it, and uh, glad glad that you have it here. Okay. We, we've corrected. we corrected. I'm going to go the next one on the list with Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I love both my colleagues, one from Shelby County and from Knox County. I love y'all. And since I was kind of the representative who shall not be named, back to the Harry Potter, <laughs> I, I felt necessary to uh, uh, to discuss. I do love y'all. And I this is great because this is what our people elect us to do is to have these iron sharpens iron conversations, I think. And, and so we want that at our universities as well. But if the parent of the student who wrote me the letter that indicated that their child was forced to say these things rather than think for themselves and form their own opinion, that's a problem. It would be a problem for us. And if the adult student who I've met with multiple times who has indicated that that person, um, I don't want to set this person out by even putting a gender on them, but prevented from perhaps a licensure just because they would not agree with what the professors were talking about. Um, so I, I think that's important. I think it's a good, healthy debate. And I, um, again, I want to close this with, I love y'all. I get to work with you. I'm honored to get to work with you. We're going to dissent on these things, but I got to support this bill because I think it's the right thing. To do. Representative Fritz, thank you. That, and that's what we're here for. We are, you know, like you say, we all have different opinions, beliefs, but we have to hash it out and work together. That's why I want us to always keep our debate uh, civil. Representative Parkinson, what you did, I recognize you. Ooh-wee, thank you. Came back around. How about that? 
and, and thank you for your words, uh, Representative, Representative Fritz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I was in 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 in, in your words uh, are are incredibly impactful, and I, let me explain why. You know, <clears throat> you know what 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 my my colleague just said is, you know, to be able to debate and, and dissent on on these issues, right? And I think that's what we're robbing the university students of. You know the ability to to have these discussions and 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 you know and debate on these issues. You know you know what's interesting too is, is something that you alluded to, uh, Chairman Reagan, is is testing, right? And maybe we're we're actually barking down the wrong path. Maybe we should be looking at whether or not that that person has to agree with what that professor says in in, in testing, right? And you know just because. If you disagree, doesn't mean that you didn't hear or understand what the professor was saying, and 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 that doesn't mean that that because the professor taught taught you this that it's a divisive ca uh, concept. And I give you an example: we were all taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America. That's divisive as heck, you know, because we all know that Christopher Columbus did not discover this land. How do you discover a land where people already existed? And where they were already living, to the surprise of the natives, he discovered America. Please explain it. That's divisive, right? But yet we push that narrative, and and we're tested on it in school. Remember, all of us took a test on Christopher Columbus and the Pilgrims, right? As if as if the Pilgrims came here and they had this kumbaya moment with the natives, and we know that's a lie, and that's divisive. But but where where the issue is 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 the fact that. You know, we, you know, we, we maybe we're not allowing our our students to push back respectfully or have that dissenting dialogue, and 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 then the focus, as you alluded to, is is testing, right? So you you have to agree with me in order to pass your test. Maybe that's the real issue, and not necessarily, you know, divisive concepts. We should be we should be excited to have. Uh, to t have discussions around, you know, these issues. Just uh, uh, this has been a great discussion to me too, as as you said, Chair, uh, Representative. And and and, but but we shouldn't we shouldn't stifle curiosity and analytical thinking and and you know and and independent thinking to make you question. Well, how did Christopher Columbus discover America when the natives of America were already here? You know, we shouldn't stop that. And, and I think that this is what this legislation does. Or it might not stop that student, but it would definitely scare the dickens out of a professor who is considering even having the conversation. What do they do now? Since this is in, since I got I got 25 students in here in this lecture hall and 25 of them can report me if I say the wrong and or the wrong or or the wrong word. That is problematic for our university systems, and I hope you I hope you hear me and understand what I'm saying and why, why I'm saying what I'm saying because you know we really should maybe look at what the real mechanism is in in the testing as to whether or not I'm you 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 believe in my ideology or not, and maybe that's the real crux of the issue that that, that needs to be solved. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing me, and thank you, Chairman White. You know, thank, thank you. And I sit here listening to the conversation. One of the skill sets in conflict resolution is as we listen to each other long enough, I think we're all saying the same thing. It sounds pretty close. We'll come back around. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go to Representative Speaker, uh, Chairman Speaker. Mr. Chairman, is there anyone behind me? Representative Butler is the only other. Representative Butler. No, question on the bill. Question has been called. Any objection to the question? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2784 out of calendar and rules and keep us saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it. Please record as a no if you like with the clerk. Uh, have a question. Uh, item number 24, House Bill 390, Road to the Hill. Uh, is Ribs in Love coming back today? <laughs> He's not here. No, he's not. He's okay, not House Bill item number twenty-seven, House Bill two two one nine is Road to the Hill. House Bill number item number twenty-eight, House Bill two 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 four by Resident Love is Road to the Hill. Uh, Representative Parkson, House Bill two three eight one. Would you like to carry your bill today? Uh, I, I would. I didn't even realize I had a bill today, but let me see. Summer second. Yes. Summer second. If, if, if I if I would have known I had a bill, I probably wouldn't did as much talking as I've done. 
Which meal is it? It's, it's requiring DEI. <laughs> <laughs> what number is it? What number is it, Mr. Chair? It's item number 29. It's the one about proper dress. Oh, oh, oh it's not about proper dress, Mr. Chairman. Please don't code. change the narrative. I got it. I got it. I got it. Please, let, me, let me come up here so I can look at you. Motion. Vote for it. We have a motion second on House Bill 2381. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, it does not uh, have anything to do with proper dress. That was the last year, uh, two years ago version that, that helped me to get on Fox and Friends. But no, this one, what it does is it simply um, tells the um, public schools to um, come up with, create a, a, a code of conduct for folks visiting the campus and it instructs them to make sure that your uh, attorney signs off on it so that is we know that it, it fits within our code and you know doesn't violate the code and um post it so that so that visitors that come onto the campus can see it that's what it does okay with that explanation members any questions of for Rebs and parkinson Rebs and fritz thank you mr chairman could i ask thank you for bringing the bill what what was the the catalyst for the bill you recognize part. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is it, you know, so we, you know, pe people uh, will come onto the campus, right? Other than you know, students, and we haven't ex we expect them to act right, but we we don't give them any guidance in how they should act on our campuses, and that's that's simply what it is. And so this way, there will be no excuse for anyone coming on the campus acting uh, acting a nut. Further discussion. Hearing none, any, any, okay, the question has been called. Any objection? All those in favor of moving House Bill 2381 out to Calendar Rules, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It moves out to Calendar Rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee. Parson. Thank you. Members, the only bill we haven't discussed is to go back to number 26, House Bill 1634. We've got 30 minutes left in committee. We have to leave at 3 o'clock. House Bill 1634 by uh, Representative Balso. You recognize? Oh. You have a motion and a second. We do have an amendment to deal with, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, amendment number 013578. That is correct. It does not rewrite the bill. Members, do we want to have discussion of the bill before we add the amendment? Motion on the amendment. The motion and second has been made on the amendment. So all those in favor of adding the amendment 13578 to House Bill 1634 indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The chairman... Uh, Representative Bolso, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, this is a bill that simply cleans up some of the language in our teacher code of ethics in, in Title 49. Currently, uh, the code of ethics provides at 49-5-1003 that a teacher should not treat a student unfairly on 13 different enumerated bases. And obviously, because it's inappropriate for any teacher to treat a student unfairly on any basis. What this bill does is simply to state that explicitly, that the teacher's code of ethics should be that uh, no teacher shall teach a, a that shall treat a student unfairly on any basis. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to respond to any questions. Okay, we will get to the committee. We also have two uh, who have signed up to speak on this bill. And we will allow them to come up. For, before I do that, any committee members want to question Representative Bolso on his bill? Okay. Do we have Macy? Fl What's it? it? Well, if you have any questions that, while we're on the bill, before I go out of session, we have a couple of guests who want to speak. Representative McKenzie, you recognize? Oh, but so, so my question is: Do uh, will we have an opportunity to speak? on the bill after the, our guests. So do you want that to happen now no. and end with the guests? No, you have you, you have an opportunity now and after. Okay, uh, I'll wait to after. Representative Parson. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Can you put me number one on the list after the person speaks? Yes, sir. You're, and, and, you're, and Representative McKenzie right behind me, if you don't mind. You're, <laughs> we'll let him speak for himself, but you're always number one. Thank, okay. thank you, sir. Uh, without objection, we're out of session, and I'm going to ask is Macy Fluarty here. And what about, is it Jason Wilder? It's only Macy. He was supposed to testify against Mary Littleton's bill. You did not call him up for that. <laughs> okay, we had him on this bill. 
Okay. Uh, would you please identify yourself mm. for the uh, AV record, uh, state your name, and then uh, you have two minutes to uh, express your yourself. You're recognized. My name is Macy Fluharty. I'm a Davidson County resident. An educator has an obligation to their students to ensure them a proper education. This is codified in the Teacher Code of Ethics. In this code, we see specific communities listed to be protected from discriminatory practices in the classroom. We have protected classes to avoid prejudice actions aimed towards communities that have historically been discriminated against. The sponsor of this bill claims this edit will make it so all students are protected. This is not true. It removes protection from students at risk of discrimination, despite the demand that all students be treated fairly. This bill aims to take this protection away from marginalized students under the claim that other students are currently excluded from fair treatment. This is also not true. The obligations teachers have towards students are for all students. This includes item B3, providing students with professional education services in a non-discriminatory manner. Removing section two of article 10 of this code does not broaden protection to any students. It removes specific protections for classes that are not protected under federal or state law and are still discriminated against despite B3 of this code. This would take away protection of discrimination of people based on their family, social, or cultural background, such as a student with an LGBTQ plus family. This also takes away protection of LGBTQ plus students by removing sexual orientation from this part of the code. These are not currently protected classes under federal or state law. This bill also proposes taking gender identity out of the family life curriculum. Part of school is learning about the society around you. Gender identity is a societal factor. Children have a loose understanding of gender already because of the world we live in. Learning about gender identity can clear any confusion they might have on this topic. The topic simply teaches children about the society around them. Remo removing this teaching does our children a disservice. It leaves them uneducated and underprepared for things like relationship building and employment environments. When we take prevalent information out of schools, we leave it up to students to learn on their own. This leaves children to learning on the internet what their school system will not teach or to ask adults who are ill-informed about gender identity. This can lead to misinformation or misunderstanding and can in turn contribute to an uneducated and potentially dangerous society. We should aim to educate our students, not hide information from them. This bill blatantly targets LGBTQ plus people. It not only removes protection from LGBTQ plus students, but it also seems to depress, suppress, or distort subject matter relevant to student progress by removing gender identity out of family studies, which is against item B6 of our teacher code of ethics. Before voting, I asked this committee again to ask yourselves, is this why you ran for office to pass blatantly discriminatory laws against marginalized constituents and children? Please vote no. Thank you very much. Members, anyone want to ask a question while we're out of session of our guest? Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to our guest, uh, you are in indicating with your testimony that teachers are charged with providing protections that are not provided anywhere in federal or state law. So by what authority do teachers have to provide that protection if it's not in law? This is a protection. Oh, One moment, you're sorry. recognized. Thank you. Um, from my understanding, this is protection from discrimination. So this would protect students from teachers discriminating against them. Chairman Reagan. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't make my question very clear. If it's not protected in law at the federal or state level, what authority does the teacher have to exercise any authority in that regime at all? I, I'm i sorry, I don't see this as a teacher authority thing. It's more, from what I can understand, legal authority saying what a teacher not can or can't do, but um, sorry. You're fine. You're recognized. Um, thank you. Um, sorry. Can you rephrase that for me? You recognize Chairman Reagan? If I understood your comments correctly, you were saying that passage of this bill removed the teacher's ability to protect uh, or from a discrimination, but that discrimination is not cited anywhere in federal or state law. So the question to you is by what authority does this teacher exercise that protection? You're recognized, ma'am. 
Um, from my understanding, this bill doesn't remove a teacher's ability to protect. It removes a student's safety from discrimination. Chairman Reagan, any follow up? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I guess we're, we're having a communication problem here. The student's safety, if, if your implication is there, is being protected by the teacher. That's your, your, what you're implying. So the question before you is, by what authority is that teacher exercising that? For example, a law enforcement officer protects the public, but only to the extent authorized by law. So if these teachers are protecting students, what law is setting that extent for them? You recognize? Uh, I mean, the teacher code of ethics specifically says that these students cannot be discriminated against. So if this... You recognize Chairman Reagan? So this bill is changing that? Yes, this bill is but taking away the, in the you, are, you stated that's nowhere else in federal or state law. You recognize, ma'am? Um, the federal and state law does not protect uh, like students um, of sexual different sexual orientations and... Thank, thank you for that clarity. Anyone else have a question while we're out of session? Seeing uh, Ms. Flaherty, thank you so much for taking time to come today and express express your belief. Uh, without objection, we're now back in session. Uh, we got Representative Parkinson. You're on the list first. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How many people you got on the list? Uh, four. Mr. Chairman McKenzie, behind me. And then Mr. Representative Ritchie and Representative Warner. Okay, roll me one space, please. Representative McKenzie, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the sponsor, so to be clear, what this bill does is delete the part of the family life curriculum that talks about uh, the gender identity curriculum. Representative Bolso? Well, and, and there's another piece that it does. And then okay, sorry. follow up. Thank you. And this is, so it's two parts. So it deletes that part, and it also deletes sexual orientation from a protected class of individuals, correct? Representative Bolso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would not, Representative, articulate the bill quite that way. Uh, the way I would articulate it is that it restates um, subsection B10 of the teacher's code of ethics to provide that no teacher may treat any student unfairly on any basis. Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So pretty much all the the big things on the previous, what 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 was deleted and on any basis inserted, um, Pretty much everything else comes in under federal law. And so the only thing that would change would be, I guess, marital status and sexual orientation. Am I correct in that? Resident Balso? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, respectfully, Representative, no, you're, you're incorrect in two respects. First, uh, this is not an anti-discrimination provision because when you look at it, it uh, precludes any teacher from granting any advantage to a student on any one of these 13 bases. So this particular part of the code of ethics is dealing with treating students differently for what you might call things that are accidental to their existence. Uh, there are, of course, other parts of the teacher's code of ethics that deal with discrimination. This is not one of those provisions. And then secondly, um, you use the term pretty much, um, and I, I would not agree that most of these classifications have any protection under federal or state law because, you know, as you've mentioned, uh, sexual orientation is one, family background is another, social background is another, cultural background is another, political beliefs is another, religious beliefs is another, and to my knowledge, none of those categories are protected under either federal or state law. And so what the bill does is state what I think every fair-minded person would agree, 
that no teacher should treat a student unfairly on any basis. It should be, I think, a very non-controversial topic. You follow up, Reverend McKinney? Yeah, this, my last follow-up. Thank you for that, and you're absolutely correct. I just wanted to, to shorten my question because I know folks get frustrated on, on, as we go on, but but you're, you are correct. Let me be clear on that. Um, and th those things aren't protected. But we kind of know what the main things are, is what I'll say. And I would suggest to you that it would have been, and I, I really think this, that language, you're right, it opens it up to a very litigious uh, situation. You can sue on anything now. You, you discriminated against me because I dyed my hair blue. It will be covered on any basis. You didn't call on me all day because I dyed my hair blue with that being the only thing, period. You discriminated against me because, you know, I wore a red shirt today. That will be covered under this change. Um, that that will be a suable offense. Um, so I do agree with you in that this opens up that pipeline tremendously. So thank you. Representative Bolso, you have a follow-up before I go to the next person? I, I, I do want to comment on that, and, uh, you know, perhaps we could get an, an opinion from the Office of Legal Services about this, but I don't believe that this opens up uh, anything uh, to a lawsuit because I'm not aware that there's any private right of action that anyone has to enforce a teacher's code of ethics. There are, of course, other federal and state laws under which one who has been harmed by a violation of law has a private right of action, but I do not believe that this bill is going to make anyone more suable to use the representative's words. Representative Parks, let me come back to you now um, before I go on the other. Uh, I have nothing, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, let's go to uh, Representative uh, Ritchie. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Sponsor. And, uh, my colleague from Knox County uh, hit hit on the the topic there that I, I was just wanting to make sure that we end up addressing there. I've had uh, multiple conversations saying that somebody's going to be excluded from this, but with the word on any basis, it actually includes everybody else. So there's nobody being ex excluded. If anything, we're bringing additional protections from discrimination into this. So thank you, Resident Warner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move previous question. Previous question has been called for. Any objection? Hearing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 1634 out to calendar and rules. And it can be saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it. If you'd like to be recorded, no, please see the clerk. Uh, members, that, except for those who rode to the Hill, uh, Chairman Spicky, any objection to us? All bills that are not heard at this point will be rolled to next week's calendar. We will be meeting again next week, committee. It, we are adjourned. Sir.